Um, so yes, my name is Kristin. I work for Maritime Archaeology Limited, which is also commercial. Um, it's actually an, um, non non NGO, non governmental organization. So we work in the marine zone, which the name <coughs> goes away. Um, and I'm really happy that Alex's um, presentation started with what maritime archaeology is and, and covering some of the areas that I often forget because I've been doing this um, for a long time and I kind of forget that everyone doesn't know the, how the kind of marine um, industry work and, and how the landscape has been connected to the mainland. <coughs> so, it's, it's, so I'm going to take off kind of where Alex left off and also res um, respond to some of the questions that you raised. Um, I'll mostly be talking about the maritime archaeology in the commercial zone and kind of focus on the challenges and advantages of development-led archaeology in the marine sector. Um, so by focusing on the offshore wind farms, um, and as Alex said as well, there are other industries in the offshore um, zone, but, but in this case I'll be focusing on the wind farms. The geological studies in the wind farm context as well. So we're using two offshore wind farms as case studies, the Gunfleet Sands in East Anglia, and present you with some results. Um, so over the last two days, we've seen, um, we've seen brilliant presentations, and, and all of you kind of been able to, to show your site, and you've been able to point out exactly where you got your very important samples. Um, but this is kind of what I see <laughs> on a good day. Um, we, do, <laughs> we do have data, obviously. Um, like on previous presentations as well of of the sea floor, but but I mean, this is what we see. Um, so that's why I present you with a nice shipwreck picture instead. This is a photogrammetry <laughs> picture of a um, well, of one shipwreck. Um, but what, what I really want to highlight is that um, over the last few years, there's been a change within um, the offshore commercial geoarchaeological field, um, and um, the change is a positive one. We can see quite clearly that um, the curator, Historic England, um, the contractors, so, so the developers of, of these wind farms, are getting more interested in taking this much more seriously. And they start understanding why they should share their data with archaeologists. <coughs> and it's also um, supported by the environmental <coughs> impact statement. So every time a offshore development is being planned, they need to put together an environmental impact assessment. And one chapter of that is archaeology. And a part of that chapter now is also geoarchaeology. Um, and these developers, uh, they do collect data anyway. Uh, so they collect geo, uh, physical data, which is the site scan, the bathymetry, um, sub bottom profiler. And they collect boreholes, survivor cores, and CPT data. Um, and I'll be focusing on how we share that with the companies. Um, this is just a really, really brief overview of how we work with the geotechnical data. I won't be f uh, focusing on the geophysical, the, the bathymetry and site scan, because that's mostly used to find shipwrecks and what's on the surface of the seafloor. Uh, but when we w work with this commercial data, we do uh, it in stages. So the stage one is the core log review. We look at these core logs and um, we talk to the companies and we present method statements to really focus on the cores that are, are of archaeological interest, because not all of them are. If a, a certain number of cores go on to stage two, we do some core recording. Um, not all cores are as dangerous as this one. Um, we don't know as well as this was a lamp core with um, asbestos in it. Um, then if the core recording shows that this is still interesting, has potential to contain uh, macro and microfossils, go on to pollen, diatoms, etc. Um, then it goes on to stage four, which is more analysis, pollen counts, and then stage five, which um, hasn't actually happened very much. So stage five is a publication that will be um, an article in a peer-reviewed um, journal, for example. Stage one, three, one, two, three, and four produce their own reports, and those reports go into the great literature, but it doesn't really highlight the importance. And it's only over the last few years where we see actually the stage five being pushed because this stage can end at any stage. So if you do stage one and you say, actually, I don't recommend a stage two, there's nothing there of interest, which can happen on, on some really um, shallow water course, for example, in the tides 
or you stop at stage two and say, all right, <coughs> it, it might have been interesting, but it actually isn't. I don't think we're going to get any pollen or diatoms or anything. Or you go on and et cetera, et cetera. But now we're moving on to the stage five in, in these really big projects as well, because it often, often stopped at stage three or four. Um, but it's not only, so I'm going to turn this video while talking. Hope you can see it. Um, but it's not only the curator of Historic England and the archaeological community that, that feel this increase of, of interest. It's also um, the higher management at these companies that are actually producing this data. So before we go out, before the project starts, we liaise with them and, and uh, we go and give a training session to all of the offshore um, chorus and talk to them about not throwing the nice top bits overboard and actually showing what is important, how can we share data, how can they pass it on to us, who should they contact if they find something. Um, so that's a part of it. But, but now higher management has also started to come along to these training sessions. And here we can see um, this lady is obviously very happy to be there and this man is pretending to be an auric by holding a, a jaw. <laughs> so we talk about deposits, we talk about, you know, where are we likely to find archaeology, why are we doing this, because that's always a question and I think we all guess it quite a lot. Why are you doing this? Why, why do you get, how do you get any information out of it? What are you learning? So um, these are kind of the two, two opposites. Please ignore that he's not wearing a hard hat. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not my responsibility, luckily. <laughs> um, but there are challenges, obviously, with the data. I mean, in an ideal world, um, we would get this massive big vessel and we would just be able to core anywhere we want on this. This is um, on the west coast. Of, of England, and um, we just go out and take millions of cores and analyze them all, and uh, do a brilliant model and great understanding, and probably come across some brilliant archaeology. But that's not really the reality. We're dependent on using the cores that they plan in. Of course, we can have some input into it. We can liaise with them, have input, but still, they, the wind farm developers, need to put their cores and their material where. Um, the turbines are going to be, or where the cable is going. Which often makes you end up with a very strange model where you have loads of cores that way and then a lump there. So you don't get a grid, you don't get, it's hard to get an understanding really. And, and uh, I mean, this is 150 um, square kilometres. So it's a big area out in the sea. Um, but also, as, as was mentioned earlier in the in the presentation, I just have to mention that data like this is not only being captured by, by wind farm and, and commercial companies, also being used um, um, in research projects. And there's a new one starting in the North Sea now. Um, this reconstruction is uh, made by Pitching Gap in 2011, Birmingham University. Um, it's looking at the East Irish Sea and what it used to look, uh, what it used to look like with this thriving, amazing environment during the Mesolithic. And this is what we have now. So this is kind of the gap that I'm trying to, to connect the two, the two environments we're trying to connect by doing this. Um, so that brings me on to my first case study, which is Gunfleet Sands Offshore Wind Farm. It is about 8.5k outside Clacton on sea. Um, and um, the... Um, it's one of the first offshore wind farms. So, so offshore wind farm and wind energy is the fastest growing energy uh, use of energy in, in the UK. In 2016, more energy and more electricity came in from wind farm than from, from coal. So it's an industry that is growing and um, it's only really been growing since 2000 and early 2000s. So the first co consent started to come in around 2004, uh, which was the blip and then the Gunfleet Sands was the other, one of the first ones. And there are guidance, so it's not like archaeologists go out and, and, and randomly do it. The guidance is obviously based on, on all of the land things and all the previous projects. Um, and the guidance we're using now is uh, well, published in 2010, 2011, to really work with, with the developers. Um, so this wind farm, um, Gunfleet Sands, um, sorry, um, Gunfleet Sands is in Essex, and it's made up, up of three um, stages, really. So stage one, consent was given 2004, and then stage two, 2008. 
and that's 48 terabytes <coughs> out at sea and one cable route. But then in 2010, it was extended um, with another cable route, but only two turbines because they wanted this demonstration turbines. They wanted to um, put in new turbines to see how they could be capturing more electricity. But that meant a new cable route went in. And in this presentation, I'm only going to talk about this cable route and this area because the combina combined data from one, two, and three will be pub published later um, this year in an article. So I won't really go in on that. But um, during the geophysical data, there's channels there, there's um, loads of wrecks and other material as well. Um, of the 15 viable cores uh, collected along the cable route and a few inshore, four of them were passed on for, for uh, further um, assessment and analysis as per the, the staged approach that I showed you. Um, so in total, 77 samples were looked at, mostly pollen, diatoms, foreign mollusks, osteocots, macrofossils as well, and C14 samples. And just using pollen as an example, we have, um, this is more, I mean, this is nice to look at, but this is nicer to look at. So we got gooseford oak, air grasses, ferns, um, we also got mosses, this sphagnum, which I put in the article, so I better, uh, or in the title, so I better mention it. Um, so it's a typical Holocene environment, really, here, <coughs> with a changing environment as well. Um, and by, by um, using all of the data from all of the 77 samples, we managed to, to make a deposit model, quite normal, so you see you know, a Holocene. So the land is coming down, and it's going down to about 20 metres there. And as you saw, all the mobile cores are taken in a, in a line, which does limit your deposit model. But you have um, a base of London clay, and then some places in deposit, really, but they've been inwashed and reworked. The Holocene alluvium and the Holocene kind of a lag gravelly deposit here, indicating that we have some channels going probably that way, both of them. Um, and some humic clays, which are really interesting and good for, for um, preservation as well. And then that's overlaid by Holocene marine deposit. So when the sea comes in and starts covering, and then marine, um, some marine sands at the top, and topsoil here as well. Um, but what does it actually tell us? And, and that's a very important question which Alex was uh, mentioning as well, that, that we're not actually looking at a site. We don't have a particular site. We don't know. We don't have any archaeological material. We're looking for a landscape. We're, we're showing where the potential for these sites are. And, and like you asked the question as well, but can, we, can we build a model? And we can try, we can do our best. And, and we can um, look at where the people lived by the edges of the channel, as we know. So we don't want to drill in the middle of a channel, we want the edges. We want to try to understand where, they can, where the potential really for, for people are. But with the hunter gatherer, which mostly people would have been around this time, it's very hard to pinpoint down, and you have to be lucky if you if you put a core in and actually get <coughs> an archaeological object. But we came from the landscape and from from all the other archaeological sites around the country and around um, the other side of the channel. Really, start thinking about when um, how this <coughs> looks. So this was a wetland um, estuary, and and it was inundated about end of uh, six thousand years ago, seven thousand. So it kind of correlates with other wind farm data as well around that day. And um, you can see that the alluvium is pushed inwards at the same rate, actually, that Alex mentioned. I put about one metre per hundred years down. So, um, And then you get a fresh water input as well, and you see that the wood's close by. So the environment is very um, rich and full of... Um, full of material for people to, to use and live in. Um, my other case study is from the East Anglia offshore wind farm. So this um, is a bit further out and a bit further north. You can see it says 55k out from, from the coast. Um, you get a um, cable route coming in that way and the red zone is where the wind turbines will be. Um, this project is still ongoing and it's a little bit more challenging in terms of uh, um, 
the um, material that we have. But it's also very special because um, if you remember the staged approach going from one, two, three, four, five, in this case, um, it had gone to three and recommendations had been made to take on stage four. Um, but it was felt from, from the curator's side that actually um, it's not enough data. We don't have enough data from this site to mitigate the impact of the wind farm. We need something else, we need something more. Um, which obviously the develop developers, even though they have started understanding it, they weren't very happy with it. Because they felt like they've already done it, can we just stop doing this now? Now we have to go back, we have to do more. Um, so um, what we then agreed wa on was that we, um, <coughs> we look at these purple um, locations and we look at some cores that had already been collected by the cores down here. And you're allowed to um, take three more up here um, for archaeological purposes and for OSL dating. So they will be collected specially and make sure that no light gets to the cores. But you're still limited <coughs> to where the turbines will be. So we couldn't put the cores wherever we wanted. We had to go to where they were taking CPT anyway. Um, so we did that. And the cores, just going to talk a little bit more about this map. So the cores show that this map, which is a kind of a combination of um, British Geological Society map, which aren't very correct enough to see, actually, and also um, the geophysical examination show that the yellow um, should be young with roads, the, push, the, the position that we have. Uh, brown bank, and these are channels, the blue ones. So we wanted to target the brown bank, Yon Throats, um, to tie it into land sites. And um, if we look at the B, B21 here, we, we found, we were expecting brown bank, which is kind of a um, clayey, muddy inside <coughs> dimension deposit, which should, um, which, which should really be there, according to the maps, but that was wrong. So, so instead we have a very sandy sediment there. But it's the same date. It's just a completely different type of sediment. And um, the same uh, happened in, in another court, but here in, in F29, where we looked for Yarmouth Roads to deposit to tie it in with um, forest deposits inshore. We um, probably found it, but didn't get any dates and very little data from that core, actually. And then um, G28 as well. So we have the Svician and Wolstonian formations. So it's, it's not what we expected at all, which is very interesting. Um, we also looked at VC72, one of the purple dots, where we have a lot of OSL dates. We have some of the OSL dates from the others. So we've got five dates here. We can see it 203 and 271 thousand years ago. So, so there's been reworking, which we can see in the um, Ostracod's data as well. There's been a lot of reworking of this material, which isn't surprising. But what it does, it really puts us in a time frame. Um, very, very nice to top pages here, and temperature here. It puts us in a time frame where there's very little proof for human activity on the island. And any, nothing around here, very little. But you can also see the temperature really falling. And most of the, has, uh, most of the oscillates come around here. Um, isotope 5, where you have a big drop in temperature, which is something that the ostracods um, and forums witness of as well. You can, you can really see that it's, it's a cold environment they're working on. Um, I just have to mention the Mesolithic. One of the research questions focus on the Mesolithic and it just confirms the types of forests. <coughs> so they go from birch kind of to more oaky forest from uh, wild herds and environment where you would have had a lot of megafauna to freshwater lakes. And they're just confirming other Mesolithic studies in this area. Huh, summary. I think I made it in 20. So maritime archaeology is an important part of the environmental <coughs> impact assessment. Offshore wind farms gather both geophysical and geotechnical information, which is something that we use um, to provide the archaeological chapter. And data is being used to understand really the subsurface and the people that lived here. I think Amphrey says it's a thriving Holocene environment, and East Anglia is um, focusing on remapping the Paleolithic in the Southern North Sea. And I'd like to leave you with a quote. What is a scientist after all? It's a curious man, and I'm sure he meant to write woman. It must have just been a title. 
looking through a keyhole, the keyhole of nature, trying to know what's going on. And that's kind of how it feels. You're looking into a borehole, you're looking into two boreholes, but it's just a keyhole, really. And we have this whole amazing set of data, and we have this resource, but, but we're just allowed to really look through the keyholes. But it is getting better, and, and that's something um, I'm very proud of. So thank you. Thank you.